This is lesson 4-3's homework assignment in the textbook. We're starting with number one. So the table below lists the charges for color copies of digital photos at two different camera shops. So you've got the prices here for shop A and shop B. So letter A. For what number of copies is shop A's less than shop B's? So it looks more expensive, more expensive, even. And then from four dollars, five, I'm sorry, four copies, five copies, six copies, from there up, it looks like it is cheaper. So I'm going to say four or more. Letter B, for what number of copies is shop B's less? So again, even is three. So for two or for one, shop B's is less, A's would be more expensive. So two or one, you could say two or less, but obviously less would only just be one because you don't have to calculate less than one for numbers of copies here. Letter C, we're going to graph the cost of the copies. So we're going to put the price on this side and number of copies across the bottom. And let's see, we got to get all the way up to 255. So I'm going to count by whole dollars here $1, $2, $3. Here's zero. $5, here's zero. So one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, starting with A, it's $1.30, so that would be a little bit less than half. At one, so right here, and then for two, we're at 55, so that's going to be pretty close to the middle of one and two. For three, it's 180, so a little bit closer. Four, we go over two dollars, so just over. And you can see this should form pretty much a straight line. The more accurate we are, 230, so not quite to halfway. Five and six is 55, so just over halfway. So this line here is fairly straight. This is A. And B, we just need to be careful, make sure we stay under it where it needs to be under and over where it's over and then cross where it crosses. So for one copy, it's $1.20. Well, A is $1.30, so I gotta keep it underneath of it. For two, it's at 50, A is at 55. So just under it. Three, they're in the same spot, 80. Four, we're at 210. So just above the 205, we've crossed over. For five, we're at 240, a little bit more. And at six, we're at 270. So it's starting to get farther and farther away. So this one goes under and then up. And there's your graph. And then answering the question, which graph is higher for seven copies? So that would be B, of course. Oh, and we forgot to answer for two copies. So I'm going to say A is higher for two copies. So for two copies, it's just above it. And we can pull that from the table, of course, as well. And B is higher for seven. All right, if Y is the cost of X copies, so this is your Y value, cost of the copies, and X is the number of copies, what are the X, Y coordinates of the break-even point? That's where they cross. The X value is three copies. And the y value, where they cross, is $1.80. And so that's the xy coordinate of the break even point. Number two. So this graph here is from a bakery, sugar, and flour. It shows you how many pounds are in each bakery storeroom over a period of days. So as the days go on, they're using the flour and the sugar at different rates. 
we obviously started with more flour than sugar, but sugar is going down at a slower rate. They're using less of it. So eventually, in terms of how many pounds they have, flour, while it starts off as much more pounds, will eventually be less. So letter A, estimate when the bakery has the same amount of flour and sugar. So it looks like they cross right here. And so that would be uh, the 12th day. Letter B, give an example of a day for which there is more flour than sugar. So any of these days up here, you can give an example. So I'm going to say day two. As long as you say something that's less than 12, you're good. And letter C, we're going to use an inequality. So that's a less than or a greater than statement to describe when there is more sugar than flour. So there's more sugar than flour when the x value or the days is greater than 12. So from 12 up, there's more sugar. So when x is greater than 12, we wouldn't say equal to because at 12, they're the same. So where is it more sugar than flour? It's everything above 12. X is greater than 12. All right, we have rental car companies here. And they're going to tell you exactly what's going on. They've actually given you the equations as well. So one of them charges 18.32 plus 32 cents a mile. One charges 26.24, but 20 cents a mile. So a bigger initial charge here for roads rentals, but they charge less per mile. The extra values, less up front, but more per mile. So eventually, because they're charging more per mile, it will get more expensive if you go far enough. But if it's a short distance, then the more up front would be more expensive. All right, so letter A, we're going to use the graph to approximate the point of intersection. So it's somewhere in here. To me, that looks a little bit higher than 60. Now, if this is the point of intersection, I'm going to write it as, as an ordered pair, an x and a y. So I can see the answer key actually says 70. I think that looks a little high, but we're estimating. So I'm going to say maybe 68 miles because, again, it does say approximate. So if I went ahead and used these equations, I could figure out the exact amount. But this says use it to approximate. So on this graph, graphs are not perfect. To me, that looks like it intersects in here, so high 60s. So I'm going to say 68. And then it's just below the 40 line, so maybe 39. Letter B, what does the x-coordinate of the point of intersection represent in the problem? Uh, so the 68, basically. Can you explain that? So 68 is the number of miles. And what does the y-coordinate represent? That's the charge, so a $39 charge from the company. So just explaining those numbers. Okay, letter C, we're going to use the graph to determine which company is less expensive if 80 miles are driven. So just looking at the graph real quick, here's 80 miles, boom. The red one, which would be the roads, is going to be the one that's less expensive. It says explain why. So this is the red line. And it's, it's lower at 80 miles. So this is the nice part about a graph. While it's not exact with that intersection, it's kind of hard to see. If you start getting up here and you're just calculating which one should I use, looking at the graph gives you a nice quick indication of what's the better one. Okay, number four. So we've got all this information. These two tie together. We've got this one place called Coolsville. It's currently this many people, and it's growing 600 per year. And then across the river is this other town. We'll call that Dull, which currently has a population of, so a bigger population to start with, but it's decreasing going down by 300 per year. So the graph and the table give you all this information. You can see the table. 
here's the starting points. This one's going down, this one's going up, and it's also represented here on the graph. So you can use both of these to answer the questions. Letter A, we're going to write an equation for Y, the population of Coolsville. So Y equals population equals after X here. So Coolsville is at 25,000. Then they're adding 600 per year, so 600X. And another equation for the other one. So Y equals, this one started at 34,900, and it's going down, so minus 300 per year. Now it says give the approximate coordinates of the intersection or break even point, and then explain what the actual numbers mean. So me, to me it looks like it's in here, but if you go over to the chart, you can find out exactly where it is. So it's actually at 11, and this point, while you look over here, you're estimating, but you can see right here on the table, at 11, they're both at 31,000. 600. Now you have to explain what those mean. So at 11 years, both have populations of 31,600. Okay, letter C. Fill in the blanks. Until blank years, blank had the larger population. So Dull had the larger population until year 11. So the first blank is until 11 years, Dull had the larger population. After 11 years, Coolsville had the larger population. And then at blank years, so again at 11 years, Coolsville and Dole had the same population of 31,600. So we're kind of given a lot of the same information we already gave in the earlier question. So a little redundant, a little repetitive there. Letter D, write an inequality that represents the values of x for which the population of Coolsville is greater and an inequality that represents the values for x where the population of Dual is greater. So let's start with Coolsville. Let's put C. Coolsville is greater from everything over 11 years. So when X is greater than 11. And for dual or dull, whatever you want to call it, its population is greater for everything that is less than 11. So when X is less than 11. So practice with our inequalities there. Moving on to number five. So Theo has $30, and he's saving at a rate of $6 per week. I was about to write an equation, but I'm guessing that they're going to have us do that. Michelle has $150, so a lot more, but she's spending $5 per week. So we're talking about break-even points. When do they switch? And Michelle all of a sudden now has less than Theo. So let's see. Letter A, write an expression for the amount that Theo has after W weeks. So $30 plus six dollars they want you to use w per week letter b write an expression for the amount that michelle has after w weeks so 150 minus five per week and then letter c we're going to make a graph And we don't really know how many weeks we're going to have to go here. So I'm going to make some marks here. I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit, look at the answer key. They count them by twos. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 should be plenty. And we know we have to at least have 30 and get up to 150. So if I count by 50s, I get to 130 pretty fast. So I'm going to count by 30s, 60, 
90, 120, 150. And the answer key, they counted by 20. So you can see you can make your graph however, however you want. So this is weeks. You should always label your graph. And this is money. So let's start with Theo. That 30, okay, and he's saving $6 per week. So after two weeks, it's going to go up 12. So that's 42. So 50 would be right in between. So 42 might be right here. And then it's going to go up another 12. That's 54 when I get to 4. So 54 is about here. All right. And then from 54, go up another 12 because I'm counting by twos here. So it's going up $6 per week. So every two weeks, that's $12. So we went from 30 to 42, 42 to 54, 54 to 56. I'm sorry, 66, so here's 60, and then 66, and then it should be 78, which should be almost halfway in between here, and 78 plus 12, then we would hit 90 right on the dot, and then it would be 102, and 114, And then 126. Okay. So there is Theo increasing the bank account. Now Michelle starts all the way up here at 150. Every week goes down 5. So every two weeks goes down 10. So 150 to 140 to 130 to 120 to 110. So at 8, we're at 110. Yep. And then we're going to go to 100. And then at 12, we're going to be at 90. And then at 14, we'll be at 80. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that would be down 60. This should put us at 90. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, so this one is Michelle. And this is Theo. And use it to determine when they're going to have the same amount. So if I look at 10, week 10, Michelle's still a little higher and Theo's still a little lower. And I go to week 12, and they've switched. And so that tells me it's going to be in here, and that's about, we don't know for sure, but about week 11. All right, that's number five. So next up to the review section, number seven. These will go nice and quick. Write the equation for the line pictured here. So this line right here, the y value is changing. The x value is always 1. So that's x equals 1. And number 8, right here, the x value changes positive and negative. But the y value does not change. It's always negative 1. So it's y equals negative 1. All right, and then we went to number 10. So we're investing this much in stocks. After one year, the value has fallen, and her investment is now 7625 By what percent did her investment fall? So it's not asking what percent is it now. It's asking what percent did it fall. So first of all, if we're going to start comparing numbers, we need to know how much it fell, because we're not talking about what percent is it now compared to what it used to be. That's not the question. It's by what percent did it fall. So right now we don't have the number that even represents how much it fell. So we got to subtract So we're going to do 8450 minus 7625. So the amount that it fell is it went down $825. And we want to know what percent is that from where you started because that's what it's compared to. I had this much, it went down this much. What percent did it fall? So we are going to compare 825 to 8450. Whenever you compare two numbers, you want to know the percent. You're just dividing. 
825 divided by 8450. And you would move that over two spots to get the percent. Okay, so it's between the 9 and the 7. You could say you could round it up to 10%, or you could say 9 point, and you would round the 7 if you're going to go a decimal here. The 6 bumps it up, so 9.8%. Now that's rounded, about 9.8%. Now the way we would do this with an equation, I know we're really focused on that, you would say $825 is what percent of 8450? Because this is how much it fell, we want to know what percent it is compared to the original. So then you'd write the equation, 825 equals X percent of 8450, and then to solve it, you would divide by 8450. And then you can see this division right here is right here. So you're doing the same thing. So if you know that when you're comparing two numbers, you can divide, you can go straight to it. If you want to see it, though, written out as the equation for consistency, then you would write it out just like that. And then, of course, you get the same answer. All right, number 11 and 12. So 11 and 12 go back to your basic writing the percent equation. So what is, so x is... 25% of 60. So all we have to do is multiply 0.25 times 60. We don't have to divide anything. X is already by itself. Just go ahead and multiply and get the answer. So X equals 15. And then number 12. 110 is what percent of 100? Solve it out. Now we do have to get x by itself, so you're going to divide by 100. So 110 divided by 100. You get 1.1. But don't forget to read the question make sure you've answered it. It says 110 is what percent? So we're giving an answer that's a percent. It's not 1%. We know 1% is really low. It's a small piece of the total, right? And if you're looking at 110 compared to 100, that's not 1% of it. 1 would be 1% 1 of 100. So this is actually bigger than 100. Now let's remember, when we get to these decimals that represent percentages, like 0.45, what is that? That's 45%. What did you do? You moved it two spots. So even here, I have to move this two spots. 1, 2. When I do that, that opens up this right here. This is actually 110%. So this is a little bit of an introduction into percentages that are over 100. So 110 is what part of 100? Well, it's more than just one whole. That's why it's more than 100%. Okay, and now obviously when you're comparing these numbers specifically, percents are based out of 100. So that's why 110 is 110% of 100 because we're actually directly relating it to 100. But when a number is greater than what you're comparing it to, then it's going to be more than 100%.